We're taking all of our stuff from the book of Proverbs, which we've been going through. So why don't I pray for our night, and then we'll jump right in. God, thanks so much for how sweet this study in Proverbs has been. It's pretty awesome to think that this book, full of wisdom from hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, actually matters for our lives now and can totally change the way we think about our lives and, and the quality of our lives. So I pray that you'd help us have open minds tonight to be willing to hear your perspective on money, wealth, and poverty, and that you'd totally bless the evening tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay, yeah, so here we go. The book of Proverbs as you might have noticed if you've been with us, is a lot of short little sayings that are written by the sages of Israel, the wise men, as they observe the world and they're in touch with God and they have advice for people on how to live their lives. And so the topic of money comes up quite a bit in this book. And so we're going to jump all around. It would be a good night if you have a notebook to take down passages you like because we're jumping all around, so it's not going to be in order. But... Basically, the writers of Proverbs have an observation as they look around the world and they are like, okay, what's the deal? Well, some people have money and some people don't. Mm. Ah, it's so deep. But we're going to think about why is that? Why do we look around and some people are hugely, amazingly wealthy and some people are living in poverty? Um... One thing that I think is important as we go through this talk is to remember that the book of Proverbs is in the Old Testament, which means it was written during the Old Covenant. And the Old Covenant was an agreement that God had with his people, and it's kind of like a contract similar to like if you guys do chores at home, maybe your agreement with your parents is like, okay, if you clean the bathroom every week and do the dishes every other night, then on the weekend I'll give you 20 bucks. But if you don't, then no money. So it's like, you know, if you hold up your end of the bargain, then I'll hold up mine, and that's how this is going to work. So in the Old Covenant, God said, here's my law, here's my instruction on how to live a good life that pleases me, and if you obey my law, then I'll reward you. I'll bless you. I'll give you land. I'll give you money. I'll give you prosperity. I'll give you protection. And, you know, so as long as they do their end, then God will come through on his end. And then if you don't follow the law, then the blessings are withheld, and there might even be some punishments that are given. Okay, we, right now, year 2012, we live in the New Covenant, so that old system doesn't apply to us. The New Covenant is all about God's undeserved gift that he gives to people. So it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter how little or how much we deserve something, God has decided that he's going to give us a gift. A gift of his love, of a relationship with him, and all of that is through his son Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross by dying for our sins. And so everything we get from God is totally undeserved. And he's just pouring it out because of his love for us. And so under this new covenant, we don't have this promise of wealth. Like, if you're a really good person and you follow God, then you're going to be rich. That doesn't happen in the new covenant. Instead, the blessings that get more focus is like the eternal blessings that will last forever beyond this life relational and spiritual blessings, things like that. So, for instance, in Proverbs, there are things like this. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. So it's saying, if you're a good person, then you're going to amass for yourself a good chunk of money, and when you die, you'll have something to pass on to your descendants. Or like this, wisdom offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. So, if you live your life wisely, then you can expect to have long life. You can expect to have riches and honor. Well, this doesn't apply to us, because we're living in the new covenant, and there's just no guarantee of these kinds of things. But, the book of Proverbs still has these really wise principles that they lay down about 
finances, money, wealth, poverty, all that stuff that we can still draw from and learn from. So we're going to be looking at that kind of stuff tonight. <coughs> so some people have money. That's true. We, re we realize that. But why? Well, sometimes it's because they're wise. Like this, lazy people are soon poor, hard workers get rich. It's kind of common sense, but if you think about it, it's true, you know? If you're willing to go out there every day, put your all into your job, you're going to have a job, first of all. You won't get fired, and you're going to be making money. But if all you want to do is lie on the couch and watch TV, you're not really going to be raking in the dough with that program. Of what use is money in the hand of a fool? since he has no desire to get wisdom. And so like, you could give a fool a bunch of money, maybe they win the lottery or something, wow. But it's not really gonna do much for them if they don't care about learning. What's the best way to use my money? What's the ba best way to invest my money so that I don't run out? What's the best way to organize my life? They're just gonna squander it, and in a few days or a few months or a few years or whatever, it'll be gone. One interesting thing about this is that people can learn God's wisdom. So if you're interested in acquiring this wisdom, God will totally teach it to you. And so one thing we notice the more you hang around like people who know God is that as they learn his wisdom, as they learn what he cares about and are changed by that, their financial situation a lot of time tends to improve. For instance, I have this friend who... When she graduated from high school, she had acquired like $16,000 of credit card debt. Okay, that's a lot of money. And so at that time, she heard about God, she heard about what Christ did for her, and she was like, cool, I want that, I want a relationship with God. So she became a Christian. But she's, she's standing there like, okay, I have $16,000 of debt. I just graduated from high school, so I have this like minimum wage paying job. It just seems like how are you ever going to get out of that situation? Well, as she learned more about what it meant to follow God and uh, adopted some of his thinking on her life, it actually helped her get out of that huge pile of debt. For one, she stopped smoking pot and cigarettes, which were a giant expense for her every day. Um, she learned how to be a hard worker so she could keep a job. She learned to be content with what she had, with what God had given her. So she didn't need to go out and buy new clothes. She didn't need to go out and get the latest computer or the latest phone. She was happy with what she had so she could like devote her money to paying off this bill. And she became a generous person that could even share what she had with other people. And so it took her many years, but now she doesn't have any debt. And a lot of that is because she learned the wisdom of God. So some people are wealthy because they're wise, and also some people are wealthy because they're generous, which might seem counterintuitive. Like if you're giving your money away, how can you keep it? like this, Proverbs 11, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Okay? People curse those who hoard their grain, but they bless the one who sells in time of need. So part of what's going on here is like making friends for yourself. So if you notice this person is struggling, having a hard time, not making any grain to eat, and you're willing to lend a hand to them, then they're going to remember that. That's going to make an impact on them. And when you're having a hard time and you need someone to lend a hand to you, they're going to be more likely to do that than if you were like, Psh, sucks to be you. I have all my grain in my barns. Screw you. So part of that is, you know, just being friendly and being generous makes people more likely to be the same with you. But also, if you're a generous person, it kind of changes your whole perspective on money in the first place. So instead of looking at your money and thinking, cool, what can I do with this? What can I get for myself with this? You're thinking, how can I impact someone's life with what I have? How can I use this to serve someone else? And so you're thinking about other people. You're thinking about what they need. And that makes you appreciate what you already have because you realize that 
you have a lot more than a lot of people in this world. And you're thankful for that. And so instead of like going out and buying something new and then a few hours later having that gnawing sense inside of you, that like this emptiness that, oh, I just need to go get something else to like get excited about, you're actually experiencing this satisfaction that comes from giving away what you have and seeing it change people's lives. Jesus said it's better to give than receive. And when you start actually giving, you start realizing that that's not just a cute saying, it's actually true. It's way better to give than receive. It feels awesome to be able to serve people, and it's totally in line with the heart of God. This guy, George Mueller, has something interesting to say about this. He says, God has not blessed us financially so that we can gratify our own carnal mind, but for the sake of using our money for his service and to his praise. Now, someone with a small earning might ask, well, should I also give? My earnings are already so small, my family can barely make ends meet. I, I think this is so good for us because, like, all of you guys in this room are probably in this position, right? Where you probably don't even have a job, so you're like depending on allowance or birthday money or like just your parents being nice and giving you something. Or if you do have a job, it's probably part-time, it's probably like minimum wage or close to that. So we're not like talking careers here where you're like breaking in thousands of dollars. It's like a few bucks here and there, right? Whatever you can scrounge up. And so it's a good question, like, well, in your position, does this generosity stuff even apply? You know, should you be giving away the, like, five bucks that you have? Well, I don't know. What do you guys think? How could someone with no or little income still be a generous person? What do you think? Jack. So you're like, maybe I don't have any money to give right now, but I'm going to give my time, I'm going to give my care and concern, I'm going to listen, I'm going to spend time with someone, and that is totally being generous, I agree, yeah. What else? How could you be generous? Even with money. Courtney? Huh? Help people out? Like how? If you know someone need, has a project they're working on, maybe go offer to like spend some hours doing it alongside them. That'd be great. Brendan. Uh, there's a pretty good chance that like, even if you don't have any money, you have like tons of possessions that you probably don't use anymore. So like, you know, that bike that you can like, on a ride on, like, too small, you know, like, you know, like prices or something, you can get like that. So, like, totally. Even if you don't have it, you have things that are worth yeah, we have things that are worth money. Yeah, totally. We can sell stuff, maybe downgrade, downgrade, decide, like, I don't need the fanciest computer out there. I'm going to sell my MacBook Pro and get, like, an Acer and give the rest of the money to, like, people who really need it or something. I don't know. I just made that up. Um, but, yeah, we, have, we had a garage sale for Embassy, and I seriously gave away clothes that, like, I kind of felt bad like putting this out there for someone to buy, but we made like hundreds of dollars to send people to Epic because people will buy the things that we don't want anymore. Wait. Another example of a, an Epic fundraiser was like Andrew and Olivia had a birthday party with like a bunch of their friends. They were like, oh, just pay a few dollars and like that will go toward other people's trips to Epic. So I thought that was a good idea. Just like, yeah, you're gonna have a few dollars laying around and if everybody gives a few, and we can raise money for something, you know. Yeah, simply. that's a great example of saying, instead of getting me a birthday gift, why don't you contribute to this really important cause? That's awesome. Ted? Uh, I'm always spending money on fast food and on YouTube, so you can always buy fast food and give it to someone else. You could always buy fast food and give it to someone else, or maybe not buy fast food. Not buy fast food. <laughs> <laughs> but people want fast food. 
People want fast food, that's true. <laughs> that's what the people yeah. want. Sattler. Um, we had uh, Penny Wars here a while back, like a month or two back. And we kind of, I mean, I would help count up some of the money afterwards and like, we raised a bunch of money from that, and that was just mostly people's spare change. Yeah. Um, and the house where I live with a bunch of guys, like, we did this for a while, too. We just had a jar by the door, and every time you have spare change, you just put it in there. We ended up, over the course of, like, three months, we raised at least a couple hundred dollars. So it's like, even just your spare change here or there, if you collect it, that can be a substantial amount that you can give. That's so true. Don't discount pennies, guys. I see people put pennies in the trash. A hundred of those babies get you a dollar. Okay. And a hundred sets you off. At a store, I know. Yeah. I think there are a lot of creative ways that we could think about the money that we do spend. If you've ever, like, been at a store or a restaurant and, like, handed someone money, that's money that you had access to. Maybe you don't know how you got it, but you had it. And so think about how you're spending the money that you have in your hand. Maybe consider giving some of it to people who really need it or like God's work. Um, I can really sympathize, though, with people who say, you know, I don't have a job. I don't know how I'm supposed to give because I was in that position. I was totally dependent on my parents for money. I couldn't work because... I was in school and I couldn't do both because of health problems. So I realized I really wanted to give to God's work and his kingdom and his ministry, but like I honestly couldn't think of how I could do that. But kind of like some of the ideas you had, I realized, okay, my parents have agreed to pay for certain things for me, like food, whatever, snacks, movies, things like that. I realized when I'm about to go to that vending machine and get a snack, or I'm about to go get a pop with my lunch, how about I don't get those? But then I would keep track of how much it would have cost if I had gotten them, and I used that money to give to God. So it was really cool because my parents didn't have to like pay any more than they would have anyway, but also I was sacrificing so that I could like give my money to something that was more important. And it's sweet. My pop money. <laughs> So back to this guy's question, I make so little, should I even be included in this whole giving thing? Well, he has an interesting response. He says, my reply is, have you ever considered that the very reason your earnings remain so small may be because you spend everything on yourself? That's a good point. Think about it. If God gave you more, you'd only use it to increase your own comfort instead of looking to see who's sick or who has no work at all, that you might help them. Makes a good point, you know? Why would God bless us with more money if all we're going to do is, like, spend it on me? God's into, pe into people who want to bless other people. He wants to give you money so that you can turn around and help that person who doesn't have enough to eat or doesn't have enough to buy clothes or doesn't have enough to get medicine or whatever it is. Because God is a giving God, and so he's into people giving their money. And so a lot of times, if, if you start giving, you'll notice that God will give you more money so that you can give more away. Pretty cool. Well, as the writers of Proverbs talk about money, they realize that they're, you know, the idea of having money is cool, sounds cool, but there are actually some dangers that go along with it. So I want to talk about a few of these. One of the biggest ones that comes up a bunch is that if you trust in money or your riches, then you might end up forgetting God. So on the one hand, money can be pretty helpful. Like this says, the wealth of the rich is their fortress. The poverty of the poor is their destruction. So, you know, I'm glad that I have enough money to pay rent and to buy groceries. And if I'm sick, to buy medicine to get better. You know, money's pretty good to have if you need any of those things, which most people do. Um, so in a sense, it's like a kind of a fortress that protects you. But on the other hand, the name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. So there's this similar language, right, of like the fortress, the protection. What it's saying is, while money can be helpful, God is the only true source of security. And it's only when we are depending on him that we're actually safe. 
if we depend too much on our money, then it actually becomes like our God in our lives that we're doing everything for. And we forget about the true God, the real God. The rich think of their wealth as a strong defense. They imagine it to be a high wall of safety. So again, yeah, it's nice to have some money, but if you think that your money is going to be the thing that keeps you safe, if you're like, man, all I need to do is get into a good school so I can get a good job so I can make a lot of money so that I don't have to worry about things and I'll be safe and no one can touch me and I won't need anyone. Man, you're setting yourself up for failure. Because think about it. Even if you can protect yourself from all these crazy things that happen in this world, which you probably won't be able to, you're not going to be able to protect yourself from death. And when you die, all of that money that you've amassed is just going to be left here. There's like a story of this totally rich guy who died, and after he died, someone asked his lawyer, like, how much did he leave behind? And the lawyer looks at the dude like, kind of weird, he's like, all of it. Like, you can't take it with you. You're going to leave it all behind. And so death is either going to be the thing that separates you from your money, and the wealth that you've amassed, or it's gonna be the thing that is the gateway to bring you in to all the treasures that you've sent on ahead into the afterlife and all the things you care about so that you can enjoy them forever. And you gotta decide, you know, which is it gonna be? And I'm, am I gonna invest in the things in this life that are temporary? Or am I gonna invest in eternal things? There's this interesting prayer in Proverbs. One of the few prayers in the book, he says, Oh God, I beg two favors from you. Let me have them before I die. First, help me never tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. Huh. It's kind of strange. Why is he going to pray that? Well, for if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. So either way, he's saying, not good. I don't want to be, like, desperately poor, but also, I don't want to become too rich. The New Testament kind of echoes this thinking. Paul says that people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Wow, that's bad. You know, we are so lucky in Embassy because all of us in this room are in a position in our lives where we can make choices now to avoid this kind of fate. We don't have to just follow the crowd and get totally enamored with career and money and wealth and security, financial security. We can decide now that, you know, that's not the way we're going to live our lives. But at the same time, we can decide now to make choices so that we're not just stuck at that minimum wage job forever. We can go to school, we can get some sort of training so that we can provide for ourselves and not be a burden to people and be able to give really generously. And I think it's sweet that you guys are interested in learning about this kind of stuff now because it'll totally set you up, if you're willing to like follow this advice, it'll totally set you up for success where you're not gonna be just like on the street, totally hopeless, but also you're not going to fall into this like total trap of desires for more and more and really ruin any chance at like happiness and success in a true sense. You know, if any of us do end up in a position where we're making a lot of money, my prayer is that we would be giving it away as fast as we're making it because that is the kind of thing that will just suck the life out of you spiritually. Even if, you know, right now you've, you're excited about God, you're excited about sharing the message of Jesus with people, you're into spiritual things, if you start gathering this wealth for yourself and you're not just shut, like tunneling it outward, it's going to suck the soul right out of your spiritual life. And it's sad to see this happen to people. It's really tragic. But it's a trap, and it, it can't be avoided. It's not like you're going to be the exception where, you know, you have the willpower to, like, not buy into it but still live in this world of, like, material possessions and more. So, yeah, 
we need to be giving the money we get away and not, not plunging ourselves into ruin and destruction. Really, wealth promotes a value system that's just totally wrong. It says there is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. You know, you can think of the person who is totally successful in their career, really wealthy, and yet inside they're empty, they're depressed, they're lonely, there's no healthy relationships in their life, no spirituality, they don't have this treasure waiting for them when they die. On the other hand, there are these people who are generous, always looking for an opportunity to give, to help other people out. They want to glorify God with what they have. And on the outside, they might look poor, but really, like, they put themselves in that position by being so generous. But what they're doing is they're taking their earthly money and transferring it into their heavenly bank account so that when they get there, they have so much to enjoy. And it's not going to be just left here. Okay, so there's the risk of forgetting God. But also, when you have more stuff and more money, there's just a lot more to worry about. You know, right now we might not have that much stuff of our own. But imagine this. Okay, yeah, the rich can pay a ransom for their lives, but the poor won't even get threatened. So, that's nice. No one's going to, like... You know, kidnap your kid and ask you for money. It's like, 20 bucks or something else. <laughs> Think about this, you know. You got your free phone when you signed up for your plan. It's got texting. You can make calls on it. It tells you the time. And the date. Your dog got a hold of it, chewed up the antenna a bit, but it still works. And, uh, you know, you're not going to be too worried about this thing. If you drop it, no big deal. If you lose it, if it breaks, you can probably get, like, the next free one when you do your upgrade thing. Whatever. Compare that to getting, like, the brand new iPhone. All of a sudden, you're, like, worried about who's holding it. You don't want it to get scratched. If you get scratched, you, like, call the company and complain about it. <laughs> want them to send you a new one. You buy, like, cases and suitcases and <laughs> dogs and like your whole life is wrapped up in this little thing and you know if you were to break it or lose it or drop it in the toilet then that's like hundred dollars or I don't even know how much it costs for a data plan but a lot of money that you just like flush down the toilet with your friend and you know that's that would make me anxious and so that's, that's what we're talking about. The more we have, the nicer stuff we have, the more we're like super freaked out about it getting broken or stolen or people messing with it or whatever. So there's just more to worry about. Also, wealth interferes with your relationships. I like this one. A bowl of vegetables with someone you love is better than steak with someone you hate. This is meaningful to me because I love steak and I hate vegetables. <laughs> Some of us, you know, we grew up in families like this, where mom and dad, or maybe just one of them, were spending all their time advancing their career. You know, they didn't really have time for us to build relationships with us. They, when they did have time for us, it was like the worst time of the day for them because they'd already spent everything they had at work, and now they, like, don't have time for us. And so... You're like sitting at the dinner table and maybe you have like filet mignon and it tastes really good. <laughs> but it's like you don't even know the people you're sitting with. You don't even like the people you're sitting with. That's tragic. That's a dysfunctional family. And what, what's it for? So that you can have steak? It'd be way cooler to have like a bag of Aldi vegetables and be like best friends with your parents or something. You know, we can just, we can imagine like... You'd rather have the quality relationships. You'd rather have the family that is awesome than, you know, good food, whatever. Money's going to try to move in on your relationships and choke them out. And uh, we don't want to let that happen. Also, if you're wealthy, then there's a the temptation to get more money at any cost. So you might, like, 
compromise some of your morals in order to make more money. Better to be poor and honest than to be dishonest and rich. You know, sometimes the reason people have money is not because God is blessing them, but because they were doing illegal things or, you know, screwing people over. Okay, that's wealth. So let's think about the other side of the coin. Some people don't have money. Why is that? Well, sometimes it's because of their own foolishness. Laziness. Laziness casts into a deep sleep, and an idle man will suffer hunger. You know, if you're just lying in your bed thinking like, oh, I'm so hungry, but I don't want to work. <laughs> you're going to still be hungry. We talked about the slugger and the fool a while ago, so you can go on YouTube and re-look at that if you want to know more about that. But basically, if you're too lazy to work, you're not going to get money. Also, loaning money to others. I like this one, the borrower is the slave of the lender. So, you probably had this situation where a friend's like, oh, can you loan me a couple bucks, I, uh, whatever excuse, I'll pay you back tomorrow or when I get home or next week when I get paid or something. That's a really risky situation because, like, I'm sure their intention is to pay you back. Maybe they're evil people and they're just cheating you, but most people really want to pay you back. The thing is, if anything comes up that's going to prevent that, like another expense they weren't expecting, or they didn't get paid the amount they were expecting, and so now they don't have money, then that puts you in a really awkward situation because now you're like the credit card company being like, where's my money? And you're watching their every move and anything they spend, you're like, that's mine. It puts a real weird tension in friendships. So my personal policy on this is if someone asks for a loan, if I think it's worth it, I'll just decide to give them that money as a gift, and I won't expect them to pay it back. And if it's not worth it for me to do that, then I'm just not going to enter in the thing, because I don't want to risk damaging that friendship because, you know, they didn't pay me back or whatever. Get rich quick schemes. Facebook advertises these on the little side panel. And the weather.com, oh my gosh, tons of them on there. Here's one I found. Oh, here's the verse about it. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. You know, these things just don't work. If you're looking for, like, a sneaky way to get around actually doing any work but still being rich, like, that's just not going to happen. But here's an amazing thing I found on the Internet that you should all be interested in. How to get the biggest online money-making secret of 2012. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. This woman, she's a mom in Columbus, and she works from her home. I'm a mom. Yeah, you could be this woman. She makes like oh over seven thousand dollars a month, sitting on her couch doing nothing. Sounds pretty good. I'm in. That's the life. Who do they want? You don't need experience. You don't need education. It doesn't matter where you are. You get paid in a matter of days, and uh, you need an this. internet connection. Oh, uh, there are only a limited number of spots, so you should sign up real fast. <laughs> Don't even talk to people about it. Don't think about it. Just do it. Or move to a new area that they have it. <laughs> and so this program, basically, there's a special one-time investment of only $97. But as soon as you pay that $97, you will be sent information on how to make money on the Internet. <laughs> what? This is crazy. <laughs> Which will probably be like set up a bogus website telling people you'll give them information on how to make money on the internet and charge them for it and they'll pay you. You save a dollar lottery that you will lose. <laughs> so if you're into things like this, you're gonna become poor because you're gonna be squandering your money on scams. No Never problem. pay for a job. <laughs> That's a good principle. Okay, overspending. Spending more than you have makes you poor. Right? What? It's like math, like when there's the minus sign, and there's a number, and then a minus sign, and then a number, and then there's the result. It's like those, somehow it reduces the amount you have. <laughs> Here's one of my favorite SNL clips, and I can't say it better than this. Um, this is biblical here. Oh, yeah, this is biblical. <laughs> Those who love pleasure become poor. Those who love wine and luxury will never be rich. So if you're spending 
on luxurious things, you're not going to be rich. Okay, here's the play. Oh, I just can't get these numbers to add up. It's like we're never going to get out of this hole. Credit card debt, does it ever end? <laughs> Maybe I can help. We sure could use it. We've tried debt consolidation companies. We've even taken out loans to help make payments. Well, you're not the only ones. Did you know millions of Americans live with debt they cannot control? That's why I developed this unique new program for managing your debt. It's called Don't Buy Stuff You Cannot Afford. <laughs> Let me see that. If you don't have any money, you should not buy anything. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Sounds confusing. I don't know, honey. This makes a lot of sense. There's a whole section here on how to buy expensive things using money you save. Give me that. And where would you get this saved money? I tell you where and how in chapter three. Okay, but what if I want something but I don't have any money? You don't buy it. Well, let's say I don't have enough money to buy something. Should I buy it anyway? No. <laughs> now I'm really confused. It's a little confusing at first. Well, what if you have the money? Can you buy something? Yes. Now take the money away. Same story? Nope. You shouldn't buy stuff when you don't have the money. I think I got it. I buy something I want and then hope that I can pay for it, right? No. You make sure you have money, then you buy it. Oh, then you buy it. But shouldn't you buy it before you have the money? No. Why not? It's in the book. It's only one page long. <laughs> thinking ahead to like that home church retreat that costs 35 bucks that they really want to go to. And so they'll be like, oh, I have 40 bucks. I'm going to buy this uh, Satchel. pair Satchel. of shoes. Satchel. Satchel? Satchel. Satchel. I'm going to buy this satchel <laughs> for 40 bucks. And then when the, it's time to go to the home church retreat, they're like, oh, I don't have any money. I can't Sorry. go. Oh, you could return the satchel. Or if, you know, you lost the receipt or whatever. The return policy. you got to try, try to think ahead and think, like, is there anything else that's coming up I might want to spend this 40 bucks on? That's a little addendum to the SNL skit, but can't say it better than that. Okay, so all those are cases where people don't have money because of irresponsibility, things like that. But a lot of times people don't have money because of factors that they can't control. So like injustice and oppression, you know, a lot of, in a lot of cases it's not their fault at all. This, is, this happens in like poor countries where abundant food is in the fallow ground, but it's swept away by injustice. These rich people, these rich companies come in and like take it all away so that they can't benefit from the resources they have. This includes like structures and systems that just promote more poverty. Like, do you guys know what gerrymandering is? Yes. A lot of times it's used for like political parties, but it can also be used for like rich and poor people. So like in this district where we're evenly divided, the rich and the poor are kind of equal, right? So the poor people's vote has a chance of like making a difference. Or we could creatively redraw the districts so that three out of the four districts are made up of really wealthy people. So the last district is like screwed over. There's no chance their vote is going to like win on anything. So that would be like a system that's keeping poverty, you know, perpetuating poverty. Or people don't have the training or the education or the technology that they need to like make a living. Um, 
The poor are despised even by their neighbors, while the rich have many friends. You know, people aren't rushing to the poor companies or the poor countries trying to help them, trying to get them on their feet. You know, nobody wants to help these people. Here's, here's a piece of technology that we don't even consider technology, but it really is. A mosquito net. Costs three bucks, saves someone's life, prevents them from getting malaria so that they can continue working. They, you know, they don't have this disease that will take them out of the workplace. And, uh, you know, poor people just can't provide these things on their own, and they need someone to be willing to, like, help them out to get them started. It doesn't even cost that much. You know, medicines, uh, different technologies to transportation, a like bike so that you can, like, get to your workplace. Things like that, shoes, all these things that may seem small to the wealthy people, but for, for poverty, you know, it really makes a difference whether I can get to my job or I can't. Also, there's like ecological factors, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes. We've seen in the news how this just like devastates countries. So any chance that they did have of making a living for themselves was totally swept away by this natural event. Sometimes a person's religion or worldview can actually um, prevent someone from coming out of poverty. Like in Hindu, the concept of karma, where the things you experience in this life are a result of your past life, so you deserve whatever you're getting. Um, that concept does not encourage people to initiate improving their circumstances. And also, the reverence for animals, cows specifically, allows some people to starve while one of their major God-given food sources, cattle, consumes another, grain. So, cows are holy, so they're not eating the cows, but the cows are eating the grain, so they're not eating the grain, and people are starving. And so, their worldview is actually forcing them to stay in this impoverished state. And then a lot of times, you know, you can have a combination of all these things or all of them, so it's not a simple problem. It can be really complicated, but the fact is, these people are in desperate situations. So what should we do about it, okay? First of all, we need to understand how God sees the poor. Here's one uh, perspective on it. He says, do not tell me, as a good man did today, of my obligation to put all poor people in good situations. Are they my poor? It's like, no. I didn't put them in that situation. I'm not responsible for their life. Don't tell me that I need to, like, help them get out of it. You know, God's perspective on this is like, no, actually you're right. They're not your poor. They're my poor. I care about them. I made them. I love them. And I want someone to do something about it. The righteous is concerned for the rights of the poor. The wicked does not understand such concerns. Like, oh, why are you always bringing me down, reminding me about the starving kids? You know, it's not my problem. The righteous person actually cares. The righteous person wants to know what's going on in other people's lives and wants to do something about it. The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. Equality. We were all made by the same God. We were all made in his image. We were all, you know, given this life from him. And there's no difference. It doesn't matter how much money you have. He loves everyone. He died for everyone. He wants to know everyone. Those who mock the poor insult their maker. So God's like, I made them in my image. I love them. I died for them. And if you're putting them down, you're insulting me, their creator. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. Man. God's like, you cannot ignore this problem. You must not ignore this problem. Because he doesn't. Every time a kid dies because they didn't have enough food to eat, which, by the way, happens once every three seconds, a child dies from starvation, God sees that person. God knows what they're going through. God hears them. And he cares about them. And that's why we should, too. Something has to be done, and we can't just ignore it. So what should we be doing? Well, I think it's good to like read books or watch movies that show people's lives because we can just get so caught up in our worlds and think that this is normal. This is not normal. Most of the world is not experiencing lives like we are. And so it's good to like remind ourselves what's going on 
what is it like for other people? Also, if you have an opportunity to see it for yourself, do it. You know, sometimes the high school group goes on missions trips where you can go into like a poor community and try to like get into their lives and care for them. Um, a lot of people in our church work with refugees that have been displaced from their country and have come to America with nothing. And uh, you could you could team up with them and, and go see what their lives are like and actually like contribute to maybe setting up an apartment or studying with them or helping them learn English or something. Have you guys ever ever had experiences like this? Have you seen people who had less than you had? And what what did that do to your perspective on poverty or the poor? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Went on a mission trip like you're talking about. Yeah. And I went to a community that didn't have a lot of money, and we ran a soccer camp for them, so they could like play soccer and have fun during the day. Sweet. When their parents were off like trying to make money and stuff like that. Yeah. And it was really cool to see like even though these kids were in a completely different situation, which was weird to see. Uh, aside from the fact, but like they were the same as like they were just the same people that God still loved them. Totally. And to see that they were from such a si different situation yet the same people, which is kind of like wow, they had the same needs that I do. They had the same wants that I do. Yeah. And so it made me want to like help them out even more. Totally. Yeah. It makes you feel like I could have ended up in your position. There's no yeah. difference. Yeah. It's cool. Adam. Um. Yeah. Sometimes you see like homeless people down by like campus, mm -hmm. and uh, it really makes you think like what happened to so, like when they got put in that situation, and uh, yeah, it's pretty sad. Yeah, totally. Reminds you, you know, what you have, and uh, yeah, you feel sad for them. You can empathize with that. Abby, I was gonna talk about that too. In China, um, there are like hundreds of homeless like children who like don't have legs and like people who are like made like along the street and like it's just really really sad but they specifically told us that we weren't allowed to give to anybody because as soon as you give to one person they're like so not used to being given to that like they all like flock to you like the way you leave. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes the best thing isn't just to give a handout but there are probably some like organizations or things that are trying to help those people that you could give to. But yeah, just seeing the people um, in those situations can be really hard. Luke. I had the opportunity a few years ago to go to Cambodia with our church. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was crazy. Like, the city that we stayed in, Phnom Penh, and did a lot of our work in, had basically most families, if you could afford it, you get what's called a moto, which is like a, a like two thirds size of a motorcycle. Um, and you drive your family around on it. And, like, my family growing up, we had four cars, like a car for each person. Yeah. And, like, all of this stuff and like the people these same families you know if they could afford it had a house you know and like that house would be one or two rooms and um it was extremely like changed my perspective on a lot of things yeah um yeah it was way less than i've ever seen in america totally totally chris uh me and my brother and our parents are working in the uh, holly ministry yeah it's here in Zenos. And uh, we've actually spent a lot of time uh, with their apartments and like uh, having meals with them. And like they tell us all about their lives back in like Nepal and the refugee camps. Mm -hmm. And like it's they have a little bit better life here because they've got like shelter and food, but it's like not that much better. Yeah. Like, it's got a totally different perspective because I always thought like how can I help the poor when they're so distant from me? Mm -hmm. But like now they're like right here in Columbus, right, right. like practically down the street. Yeah, that's a great point, yeah. We don't have to travel too far to find people that are in way more situations than ourselves. Yeah. Well, I recommend doing this, you know. we got to remind ourselves the reality of people's lives, and uh, it'll help us keep in touch with God's perspective of these people. Also, give. You can make a difference by giving your money to people who need it. And uh, a while ago, MSC did a charity challenge night where we decided to pool together our money, and people did crazy things in, or in order to encourage that. And we, you know, supported a, a kid in India who, you know, ate and had school because of the money we sent to him. Awesome. Uh, we supported some of the Bhutanese refugees and. Uh, Things like that, you know. We're probably going to do another night like that um, where we're just going to, you know, try to give what we have and 
benefit these people. I think people who helped other people go to Epic, you know, some of the families, you know, some of the people who are here, the families don't have the kind of money to send them to summer camp. And if you, like, helped contribute to fundraising or, like, getting money together to give to them, that's awesome. And that's a way that you are, you know, giving to that person and sacrificing for yourself. And it's, it's sweet. If you help the poor, you're lending to the Lord, and He will repay you. God sees this stuff. He knows the sacrifices you make, and and He's not going to forget. And uh, it's it's pretty cool to know that you know God has something in store for us when we are willing to give what we have away. And like uh, Jack was saying, this is not just money. Definitely money, but also time energy, resources, all of that stuff counts. So to conclude, I just want to leave you with this verse from 2 Corinthians talking about really why we can be generous at all. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you could be made rich. And, um, you know, God had everything. He was totally rich in heaven. But he looked down on us, realized that we had turned away from him, realized we'd screwed things up for ourselves. And instead of being like, sucks to be you, not my problem, he's like, no, I love you guys so much that I'm going to come to earth. I'm going to live a life of extreme poverty. I'm going to go through a brutal death so that you can be forgiven, so that you can have a relationship with me. And uh, that's what Jesus did for each one of us here. And anyone can accept that. And when you do, you are made rich. You're given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And uh, you have this treasure that you can start building up in heaven that will be there when you meet God. So um, I think I went a little long. If people have questions or comments, we can do that, but maybe be short. Anyone have Something that sparked an idea in, in your minds? All right. How about people pray for us? Whoever wants to shout real loud. And uh, I'll close this up. Remember, next time Sandy's teaching, so definitely come and invite all your friends. Lord, I thank you so much that you put us in a position where we have money that we can't give away. Mm -hmm. uh, and I pray that you would uh, help us to realize that we are in a situation and that we can't give money away and that we will give money away. Um, and uh, I just really pray that you can help us realize that we deserve none of it we did. Yeah. Okay, thanks for sending your son back across for us. It's an amazing thing that you did. And I pray that you, uh, you know, put in our minds to make sacrifices like that. I mean, they, you know, Lord, I pray that we'd all go against what the culture does and instead that we would not be defined by what we have and by what we buy, but we'd be defined by you. Yeah, I prayed that same prayer that the guy in Proverbs did, that you wouldn't let us be too poor, but you also wouldn't let us be too rich. Um, that you'd provide for our needs and that you teach us to be content with what you've given us. And I thank you so much that you gave us the most priceless gift possible, your own life, so that we could have a relationship with you and know you and have eternal treasures in heaven with you. Uh, I pray that we wouldn't get too caught up in earthly wealth and that really we'd just be concerned with uh, giving what you give us what you give up to us away to other people. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen.